Hello everyone, Alexa Dunn here, and today I am going to be talking about tiers of marketing in traditional publishing. Long awaited, much requested, bound to be really, really long. I'm sorry, this is the season of deep dives into traditional publishing topics that I have been putting off for a really long time that are going to clock in at about 30 minutes. Uh, it's because it's a very complex topic and if you are interested in, well, how does marketing really work in traditional publishing? Buckle up, buckle in. I have a lot to say. This is part dispelling the notion, well, traditional publishers don't even do marketing anymore, so why even bother? The author has to do everything. As I've said many, many times on this channel, that is just patently not true. There are aspects of marketing that you, the author, are simply not going to be able to do that you automatically are going to get from a traditional publisher, but the other half of the reality is that there are tiers of marketing and publishing. And definitely different authors are going to get different things. It is a scale. There, there's a, I say tiers, there are tiers. There's top tier and there's bottom tier, and it is true. What you get if you're top tier is super different than what you get if you're bottom tier. And so there is definitely wide variance of how much marketing authors need to do themselves and how satisfied an author is likely to be with a traditional publisher based on kind of how the chips fall with marketing. This is also hopefully to prepare those of you who are doing traditional publishing, whether you're going to get into it in the future or you're in there now. And honestly, I will tell you, marketing and publicity is really confusing. It's super opaque a lot of the time. For some bizarre reason, traditional publishers, our publishers just don't want to tell us stuff half the time. And you will push for information and your agent will push for information and the, the publisher just kind of shrugs, even when they're doing a lot for you and doing their job and it's kind of like eh, we're doing stuff so this is me telling you if you're confused that is actually completely normal but hopefully some of what I'm going to share about the tiers of marketing and what to expect will help you figure out where you have landed in the cogs of this machine. And being able to kind of read between the lines and figure out where you're falling with your publisher helps you to prepare better of how much you need to do with marketing. But enough of all the hedging, let's jump right into two basic kinds of marketing, how they're different, which will bring me into the bare basics you will get from any traditional publisher that are an advantage to traditional publishing if you are choosing to do traditional publishing, the baseline that you get. But first, the two basic kinds of marketing consumer marketing, so consumer facing marketing. It is a business reaching a consumer to sell a product and B2B marketing, which is business to business marketing. This is the less sexy kind of marketing, the one we don't talk about as much, but is really, really important in a lot of industries, including and especially the publishing industry. And it's the B2B stuff that is baked in to what all authors get with some small variations. But this is to mean, what does business to business mean? So there's one business, your publishing house, and then there are other businesses like the bookstores, libraries, teacher associations, like kind of that falls, if a library's at a school, they kind of get <laughs> rolled up into that. Trades, so these are publications that uh, report on the book industry and business, that is B2B. And then the murky area of kind of like bloggers, reviewers, etc. They're it's kind of consumer facing marketing because they put their stuff out towards consumers. But at the same time, people who review content are part of the business as well in their own way that kind of goes between the two. But the point is, reaching other contacts within the business industry. This is how traditional publishers get distribution, sales, which is sales orders, and build inter-industry buzz among booksellers, librarians, teachers, bloggers, reviewers, etc. And this base and kind of groundswell of support that they do can be just as important as consumer facing marketing. The problem is when we say marketing, book marketing, all of us think about consumer marketing and what it takes to reach obviously the people who buy books, completely ignoring that there is this B2B side that also does reach and empower 
impact consumers. It's just slightly less direct. So meaning marketing books to librarians and booksellers, well, those are the people who are going to get books in the hands of consumers. It's a bit more indirect, but just as important. Now, this said, an important disclaimer for all of the marketing we are going to talk about. Marketing does, of course, vary widely depending on the size of the publisher, how they're set up, the reach, etc. But all legitimate, good, traditional publishers are going to have decent reach and establishment. If they don't, they may technically be a traditional publisher, but they might be a really bad one, which is a whole other topic. But I want to talk about what I call marketing basics, which are the in often invisible things that your publisher is going to do for you that are going to help promote your book, but you might not see or think of as a marketing push. So these basic standard marketing things your publisher is going to do for you in traditional publishing that count as marketing are designing a cover, writing strong back cover copy, including you in their sales catalogs. This is the B2B thing again. And connected to that, they will attend trade shows throughout the year where they will be promoting your title in their catalog, in the display. They'll be handing out ARCs, advanced reader copies. Publishers will also have a dedicated sales force and they take this sales catalog and they go to bookstores in particular and they push the titles from the publisher. So this marketing is happening behind the scenes all the time. I mentioned ARCs, advanced reader copies. This is the next basic thing your publisher is always going to do for you, though the reach of ARCs does vary, meaning some publishers will print more ARCs versus less. Some will focus primarily on e-ARCs versus physical ARCs, but advanced reader copies are industry standard. Therefore, bookstores, librarians, and reviewers like bloggers to review the book ahead of time to generate word of mouth and buzz, but also lead to sales orders with bookstores and libraries and so on before the book comes out. ARCs are also essential for things like list consideration and award consideration. There are buzz lists that your publisher will very likely be submitting you to. One important one to know about is the Indie Next list. This is decided upon by key independent bookstores and they read all the books coming out for a season and they pick a certain number of titles to be buzz titles. And if you're an indie next pick, it guarantees you a very healthy order and a special display in the store. Your ARC will also be sent to potential book boxes. This is another kind of invisible thing that your publisher is going to do. Publishers want books and book boxes, so in many, many cases they will submit your title. You might never hear about it because if you're not selected, you're not selected, but they are doing that behind the scenes work. They're also going to be pitching you as an author and or kind of your book to publications to do features leading up to release. These very widely, but to give you an example, I was pitched to the USA Today uh, Happily Ever After, which is like their romance section for an online feature. They, your publisher might pitch you to Hypeable or all sorts of different possibilities. That's the publicity department. And then of course in the bare basics is social media promotion. In most cases, most publishers now have like their own social media arms and of course they're going to promote their titles there. And lastly, a critical thing that your publisher is always going to do for you is submit your book for trade reviews. These are things like Booklist, Yalsa, Kirkus, etc. And these are the trade publications that B2B people read, that booksellers and librarians and such read, and this is what helps them place their orders. So submitting you for trade reviews is an important part of kind of the marketing ecosystem. Generally, these publications give priority to books published by traditional publishers. There are programs for self-published writers to submit their books, to pay to have their books uh, reviewed by these trades, but it is a kind of like baked in part of the ecosystem for traditional publishing. I definitely consider that a pro and something that your publisher will do for you. Like I said, these things feel very invisible to us as the author because your publisher is going to be doing these things as a matter of course. They're not going to tell you about them until you finally see the marketing plan you've been asking for for six months and they'll be listed on there. But these are things that they just are going to do no matter what that help get you orders from bookstores and libraries, buzz, reviews, etc. Which now brings me to the actual tiers of marketing. Beyond the bare basics, there are 
marketing tiers. These are going to vary depending on the publisher, which is really important to know. Top tier at a smaller publisher is gonna look very different from top tier at a big five. The best comparison I can make is that if you're top tier, if you're a lead title at a mid-sized to smaller publisher, what you're getting is probably gonna look a lot like what a mid-tier author is getting at a big five. Lead titles at big fives get a lot because big fives have the most reach and the most money. So let's talk about top tier and lead titles. We're gonna start at the top and work our way down. We're gonna work to the depressing part. So lead titles are the lead titles for any given season, meaning they are the few titles, there's usually not that many, that the publisher puts most of their money and their push behind. They're going to invest most of their resources, both financial and in terms of just the bandwidth of their employees, into those few lead titles. When you see a big splashy ass book that is everywhere and has the sexiest cover and the author is everywhere and every blogger got a copy and it's got sponsorships on YouTube and I mean a billboard. Sometimes they get billboards, which is bonkers. That's, that's a lead title. <laughs> These are considered the biggest titles of a given season because they have what the publisher sees as the biggest sales potential. Most often your leads are gonna be super famous established authors, but debuts can be made a lead title. It just kind of depends on the book and the season and luck and the publisher. So what does a lead title get? Top tier marketing, I should say. You can get top tier marketing and not be a lead lead. You can be just below a lead and be a top tier title. And again, the caveat that exactly what you're gonna get as a top tier or a lead title will vary depending on your publisher size, resources, and kind of preferences for marketing tactics, but some examples. You'll be flown to trade shows. So those trade shows I mentioned like TLA, ABA, you will be flown there to be featured by your publisher. I ended up giving a speech at a librarian dinner, which was a surreal weird thing. The authors do signings in person. You will also be sent often on a book tour, though not all publishers do book tours, but if you get a book tour, you're doing pretty well. It tends to be nowadays reserved for lead titles and top tier titles. You will be sent to major book festivals, like your publisher has submitted you to be one of their represented authors and books to the biggest book festivals in the country. And if you are accepted, then your publisher flies you there. They pay for everything. I mean, really, if you're a lead, if you're top tier, your publisher pays for everything and they send you to a bunch of places, basically. They want you out in the field promoting your book. Next, the top tier titles are going to get a lot of paid promotion. This varies widely, but generally this could be a book bug promotion, as on Goodreads, those are pricey, so on and so forth. There are also paid features. A lot of people don't realize this, but especially in the trades very often, when you see a feature on an author in a specific book, that is actually paid promotion by the publisher. Another big thing you can get when you're a top tier author is swag, where your publisher actually pays to make promotional items for your book. These are called premiums or tchotchkes, and they can be very expensive to promote. So nowadays, just with so many authors and so few dollars to go around, it really is only the top tier items that get nice premiums. Well, premiums at all, but if you're in the marketing biz, which I am, there is a difference between a 50 cent premium and a $2 and 50 cent premium, and it's the highest tier titles that will get the nicest swag if they get swag at all. Next is the hard push for a book box. While every publisher of course wants to get their various titles featured in book boxes, when you are a lead at a big publisher, I'm talking big five, they will push hard to get you featured in the biggest book boxes and you know what the biggest book boxes are. It's things like Owl Crate, Book of the Month, etc. And when it's with a really big publisher and you're a lead, this is when they're spending extra money to do special editions, all sorts of things to make your title very attractive to the book box, including swag, so that they will pick your title because book boxes can lead to very, very nice sales numbers. 
Next is paid promotion on booktube and Instagram. I've done a whole video on how kind of how it works with traditional publishers and booktube. You shouldn't be shocked. But when a title is really being pushed, especially to the big channels, like when you see those sponsorships, of course, those booktubers are being paid. And it really varies widely how much money a publisher is going to spend on a title. So if you're top tier, they're going to spend way more money to push you heavily on booktube and Instagram. You can still get paid booktube and Instagram promotions in the lower tiers, which we'll talk about. But the biggest push, the most money spent is going to be for top tier titles. Next is something I talked about in my bookstores video, which is paid Barnes and Noble displays, the dirty little secret of the industry. When you see a title featured on the display tables or any of the end caps, anything like that, the publisher is paying for that extra promotion. And when you're a top tier title like a lead and you see a special display, like it's branded to the book, all of that, that is a publisher spending real coin on a book and most most books don't get that. Next is the lead titles are going to get the big pushes for things like Barnes & Noble Book Club. I don't know if that's paid for, but I strongly suspect that it is. And Target, because you will see featured books on display at Target. And so those pushes are going to be for lead titles, though, of course, everything is always dependent on the buyer actually wanting to feature it. But I'm pretty confident that money exchanges hands for a top tier title to get push at these retail stores. Are you noticing a trend, which is if you're a top tier marketed title, they are spending tons of money on you. All of these are paid tactics that are not cheap. So next, same, uh, when you're really top tier in a lead, depending on the publisher, they may or may not run your pre-order campaign for you. It's really uncommon to have your pre-order campaign run by your publisher. But when you're top tier, very often they will. And it's with that really nice swag because you as the author, like it really adds up to do a mailing and that's anything more than flat and even flat can really add up. But your publisher might have the money to do a much fancier, bulkier pre-order campaign. The next thing very often is going to happen for a lead title or a top tier title is a cover reveal with a major outlet. Think like Entertainment Weekly, etc. Hollywood Reporter. Though I will say generally elaborate cover reveals are really going out of style because publishers are finding it doesn't have the ROI, return on investment, it's not worth the time. So even feature titles are not getting huge splashy book reveals anymore, book cover reveals. The next thing you might get if you're top tier is a custom book trailer, like a fancy one where they do like a video shoot that's usually for top titles. Same thing, by the way, with covers. I mentioned that, of course, all, you get a cover design from your publisher no matter what. But if you're top tier, if you are a lead title, they will spend more money on your cover. So this means either hiring a really good freelance designer, like a famous designer, or doing a custom photo shoot for your book. When they do a custom photo shoot, because that is really expensive, rather than using stock imagery, they're spending money on you. And last but not least for top tier, it is far more rare because of questions of ROI as well as cost, but traditional tactics, traditional meaning traditional media. Traditional tactics means print outdoor. So print newspaper ads outdoor is like billboards and the like, and then on air, which in this case, traditionally on air is like ads on TV. But books don't really get that. So in this case, on air would be those pushes you see where a fancy author is on like the Today Show and that kind of thing. I mean, that's for the top, top, top tier. Plus they have to be photogenic and comfortable uh, doing interviews. That's for like the biggest, splashiest titles. But to give you an idea. Okay, so now that you've heard of all of the fancy stuff that the top tier titles get, it's all about money. They spend lots of money on them. Now let's talk about mid tier. Mid tier can be a lot more nebulous because as I mentioned, I'm it, just the definitions of top versus mid is going to really vary depending on publisher. So the extent of what you can get, you're going to get more from a big five than you're going to get from a major or smaller publisher. De ugh, it's so complicated. So what I'm going to describe as mid tier might be top tier at <laughs> a smaller publisher. But to give you an idea, this is when you're not at the bottom. So you're not getting almost nothing. They're spending some money on you, but you're not getting quite as much as a lead title is. Not as much push and thus bandwidth from the marketing and publicity team, but also just literally less cash. But you are still getting a decent amount of marketing. 
And my feeling with traditional publishing is as long as they don't totally screw you over with bottom tier, which we are going to talk about, as long as you get anything kind of vaguely resembling mid tier, you're in a pretty good position. So what are you likely to get with mid tier marketing? Some of these are going to be similar to top tier. So one example, they might fly you to one or two trade shows depending on the timing of when your title is coming out, or it might be a trade show that's physically close to where you live, but they're not gonna take you to every single trade show for the year, but they're still pushing your title physically at that trade show. You have a featured arc, etc. Next, you will be sent to book festivals, but they're more likely to be local to you. So it's about kind of cutting back on that cost. They're gonna submit you to good festivals in your geographic area, but they're not gonna pay to fly you across the country to a festival. So you're still getting support, it's just, it's a little less. Next, no book tour. Repeating that most people don't get book tours. Not even all top tier titles get book tours because the ROI, which is the return on investment for book tours, is almost everyone agrees, authors and publishers, that it's usually not worth it. You almost always end up spending way more money than you sell copies. So you might not get set on a book tour, but let's say they are touring a lead title through your area, they would include you on the stops for that tour. Next, you get paid social media marketing. It's just a little bit less than a lead title. They're never going to show you hard dollars, by the way. It's just kind of a, a feeling that you get when you see what they do, where you're submitted, etc. of, I can tell they're doing something, but it's not like no holds barred. Next with book boxes, they're pushing you, but not for the biggest book boxes because those are reserved for their lead titles, but they are going to do a nice healthy push for smaller boxes. Might not be a special edition, but you have a good shot with some solid book boxes. And a note here, this is where there's definitely a difference between a big five publisher and a smaller publisher or a major. Giving myself as an example, my publisher was great about pushing me for book boxes, but there was just no chance in hell I was going to get into Owl Crate because they almost exclusively carry titles by the big five. But my publisher was great about getting me into some fantastic book boxes, just not the big dogs. Next, also repeating from top tier, is that booktube and bookstagram promotion. You're gonna get it, it's just gonna be a little bit less. So instead of, say, a featured sponsored video where like the booktuber has to do something specific to your book for five minutes, it might just be that you are included in a haul, you're included with other titles with other books, so it's still paid booktube promotion, it's just not the highest tier of paid promotion. Next is Barnes & Noble and book displays at Barnes & Noble. You might get paid display, but not the fancy paid display. And also generally something I wanna point out, a difference between top tier and mid tier often, top tier will often get special arcs. We've all seen the swanky arcs where they're basically a high quality paperback and they come in special packaging and the publisher prints a ton of them and sends out all these fancy boxes. That's gonna be a top tier arc mailing. If you're mid tier, you're just more likely to have a normal arc and they'll print fewer of them and do less of a push, but still a pretty good push compared to the bottom tier, which I'm about to talk about. But Essentially, if you're mid-tier, you get a nice chunk of the same things that a top-tier title is gonna get. It's just less in scale, or they're gonna pick and choose the things that they're gonna do, depending on what they feel works for your title and works for you as an author. So like, not every author is the right author to push to book festivals. Maybe you're not even comfortable doing public appearances. Not every title is ideal for booktube promotion. It's just gonna really kind of vary. But you're you're getting support, including monetary support. It's just not the top tier. <sighs> okay, now's the depressing part. So please get your comfort item of choice right now, whether that's a hot chocolate or just chocolate or booze if you're of age and don't have an alcoholism problem. So this is the worst case scenario. <laughs> this does happen. Uh, traditional publishing is not perfect. I will never lie and say that this doesn't happen. It's not as common as people think it is. Uh, people, t especially on Reddit and also YouTube, tend to be very 
dramatic and say this is how it is for everyone in traditional publishing and it isn't but it does happen so we're gonna talk about when your publisher does as little as humanly possible to promote your book remembering they are gonna do those basics I talked about so they, they do things for your book but what they're not doing is the consumer push they're doing they're basically not spending money on you it's extra money on you, extra bandwidth for their marketing and publicity team, and what is important for me to say about bottom tier marketing, again, size and scale. At big publishers, big five publishers, particularly imprints that have large lists, and it really varies by the way. Harper Teen has a much larger list per season than say Dial Books. Yes, those are two different publishers, but just to give you an idea, it really varies how large a list an imprint has. And the larger the list, depending on the marketing resources, the more likely it is that certain titles will get bottom tier marketing because it is about marketing resources. So this is another complicated thing. Every publisher is different. At some publishers, there's like one central marketing team that has to do the marketing for all the different imprints. And so then they do have to, of course, play favorites more. They have to do tiers of marketing because of bandwidth and resources. At other publishers, an imprint might have a dedicated marketing and publicity team. And obviously, if there's a dedicated marketing and publicity team, every title's gonna get a little bit more because there are literal humans there with the bandwidth to do more for titles. And then, of course, if you're not with a big five, if you're with a major publisher, so the majors who are not big five are Bloomsbury, Scholastic, HMH, and Disney. Or if you're with a smaller publisher who's really well respected, I'm thinking of like Abrams or Sourcebooks, though the funny thing is Sourcebooks is still a small publisher, but now uh, it's in the distribution family with, I believe, Penguin Random House. Yeah, Penguin Random House is now involved with Sourcebooks, but they still operate independently as a small publisher. So the point is when you're with smaller publishers, places with fewer titles, with dedicated marketing teams, there's less likely to be a bottom tier. This is what I'm trying to say. When you're with a smaller publisher or an imprint that has resources, you'll have top tier titles and then everyone else is gonna have more of a mid tier experience where you're going to get something, just not everything. But let's talk about actual bottom tier where what you're gonna get. Oh, what little you're gonna get. And what I'm going to say before we talk about bottom tier, I know I'm teasing you, it's because you're it's because you're getting your uh, comfort beverage of choice or comfort snack. Um, if you find yourself in this situation where it becomes very clear to you that you're just not, you're not gonna get much, this is when you start preparing. This is when you put out plans to take care of yourself with marketing because there are ways that you can supplement if your publisher isn't doing it for you. I think this is all about kind of knowledge and then troubleshooting and pivoting and doing what you have to. So the biggest difference you're going to see when you're in the bottom tier, one big one is very often you are not going to be assigned a dedicated publicist. I've seen this particularly at a publisher I won't name where you don't get a publicist, all the marketing conversations are gonna be pushed through your editor. That is a sign. If you don't have a dedicated publicist, you aren't on the tiers. You're, I'm so sorry. This also often means they're not gonna print very many arcs. They're not gonna distribute them super widely. They'll do the bare minimum, but you're not gonna get a huge push. And also they're probably not gonna send you many. These are always the cases where I hear from people where they get sent a measly two or three arcs, which is just stingy as heck. If your publisher isn't gonna give you a big push, they should give you more arcs so that you can push yourself, but just letting you know. It also sometimes means they don't even take you to trade shows, you're not on display. It's, it, you are a lower priority across the board. It really, really sucks. This also means you're just not gonna get a big, well, really any big promotional push. As I mentioned, this is the tier where they're not gonna spend extra money on you. So you're not gonna get social media promotion and this might be where you wanna do it yourself. You can submit yourself for a BookBub promotion, though it's kind of, you know, tricky how it works, you need a lot of lead time. You can pay for your own Storygram tour. 
way hazier. I don't think, I've never heard of authors doing direct paid promotion with booktubers, but as you know, I mean, this is our space. If a booktuber is open to it, you can always send them an ARC to see if they're interested in either reading it or hauling it. But if your publisher is not going to do it, you have to do it yourself, which I mean, full disclosure, it's super awkward. And then it's honestly up to you whether or not you want to do it because you might not be comfortable, but it does suck. It, it sucks. The other sad, sad thing, this really is depressing. Uh, when you do fall into this bottom tier, and again, this is most often when you're with a larger publisher or imprint that has a much more noisy list, way more titles, you might not get much, if any, promotion on their social media. Like I've seen cases where a book doesn't even get a book birthday post on the socials. I hate it. I think it's really awful, uh, but it does happen. It's not gonna get better. It's just, you're, I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, I'm so sorry. It's so depressing to talk about. But basically imagine almost everything I covered in top tier and mid tier marketing, they're not gonna do that for you. It's bare minimum. And when you get a marketing plan in your bottom tier, it's gonna say the most generic stuff possible, like social media promotion, distributing ARCs to bloggers, submitting for reviews, the basic stuff. So here's the catch 22. Very often, if you know that your publisher just isn't going to do much for you, so you decide to do stuff for you, it can actually inspire them to do stuff for you. I know you're like, but it's true. If you put an effort, for example, to do your own pre-order campaign, if you've commissioned art and you're doing your own kind of cute little Instagram posts, if you send those things to your publisher, it's easy to retweet, etc. They might then jump on stuff that you've done. Also, again, it's a sucky catch 22. If you do your own marketing and promotion and you do actually manage to build buzz, then they'll go, oh, the title has buzz and they might end up supporting you more on the back end. So it's annoying, but it, it's also kind of an incentive not to give up. That's really what I have to tell you. If you do end up in a situation where you're just not getting much from your publisher, do stuff on your own because it's the only thing that's in your control. So much is out of your control in publishing. So the most you can control is the limited marketing you can do that you want to do that you feel comfortable doing. This also might include submitting yourself to book events and traveling on your own and paying your own way. I do generally advise being circumspect about circumstances where you pay for your own travel to be very sparing because it's very easy to blow thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars and not get much back. It depends on your title kind of what kind of book it is and how comfortable you are with public speaking. Personally, as a science fiction and fantasy writer, I find the fan con circuit worth it. I've seen it work for other authors as well. And I do think if you're smart and selective about the events that you pay your own way to, it can actually be a very good ROI um, in the long term. But I do caution you to be careful. I have seen situations also, this isn't even fan cons, where very eager debuts have paid their own way to trade shows. And I just think that's a super waste of your time and money because your publisher didn't invite you to go. They weren't pushing you. Maybe they get you a badge for the event, but I guarantee you, you're gonna show up and walk a trade floor and feel kind of uh, because you're not the special one your publisher sent to the event. And at best, maybe you can be on a panel. And I just find that authors paying their own way to trade shows, so B2B events, is almost always a waste of time and money. Unless you're a teacher and librarian anyway, and you're going to these events because you would go anyway, and you also have a book coming out different. Uh, but that's just my personal opinion. So that brought the mood down. So marketing varies widely at traditional publishers. And it's another bummer I have for you. You can't tell ahead of time how it's going to turn out. It is kind of a crapshoot. Sometimes you're pleasantly surprised. So for example, I, on my first book, got way more than I ever thought I was going to get. I had prepared for the worst and then I got the best. And then I've had people I know who sold for a ton of money were told they were going to be a lead title and they ended up with nothing. Sometimes it's because the market shifts and it just, the, the publisher has to shift their priorities with it sometimes. So 
you go into an acquisition meeting and your editor makes the pitch and sales and marketing does a P&L, a profit and loss statement, and sometimes someone from marketing and publicity has read your book before it's acquired, but sometimes not. And what can also happen both ways, by the way, pro and con, um, the marketing team, marketing publicity team can get a hold on your book and just no one falls in love with it. And so that can lead to you not being pushed super hard by the team, but also, you could have someone fall in love with your book and then all of a sudden you're her lead title out of nowhere. That is actually what happened with the selection. When it was acquired, it was not acquired as a lead title, but some people in the marketing department loved it and decided to make it a lead, and here we are. So things just shift all the time. Publishers will also do that kind of first push where they're doing all the B2B stuff, and they are looking to see how books are received by booksellers and librarians and teachers, and sometimes and trade reviewers and bloggers. And if it just doesn't seem to be landing the way that the publisher had hoped, that can also lead to them pulling back on consumer marketing. It's this weird amorphous thing, but also it can go the good way. Let's say you're a huge hit with all of the early readers who are librarians, then your publisher might do a bigger push. So it's a real crapshoot, uh, and I know you don't like to hear that. Frankly, if you're here and you're deciding <laughs> between traditional and indie publishing, uh, I know that control is one of the huge things that can be a deal breaker for someone going between the two. And honestly, if you like to be in control, you're going to be miserable in traditional publishing. <laughs> yeah, they're have to get over it or that's it. Um, it's an ongoing frustration. And all I can offer to you is Go in with the best of hopes and the best of intentions with a contingency plan. You should always assume you're going to get almost nothing from your publisher and have a plan in place of the marketing you're going to do. And then it's a good thing if you don't have to do any of that marketing. And if you do, you do. There are things you can do yourself to build organic buzz for your book. So... And also, regardless of what tier you get, you need to do your part. You should be doing social media, doing fan engagement. Um, there are all sorts of different recommendations for what an author can do, and they really vary. But I don't know a happy way to end this video other than to say that's tiers of marketing and traditional publishing. In all honesty, though, most people get mid-tier or above the like depths of the bottom tier, it's pretty rare, but not so rare that it never happens. I will also say, this is worth, this is worth saying, honestly, there's the debut situation of how the chips fall with your debut with the tiers of marketing, and then there's subsequent books. I will tell you it's super, super common because of the push for debut culture in YA, for you to get a good marketing push on your first book and then almost nothing on your second book if your first book didn't meet or exceed expectations. So that is something kind of realistic to prepare yourself for. And it's just kind of the reality of the business. And every book, however, is a new start. So you could also get very little for one book. And then the next book just strikes the right chord. And then you get a big push. So it, it varies. Do you have your comfort item? Are you, are you okay? I'm okay, I think. I think that's where I have to leave it because this is really, really long. We're gonna consider this mostly an informational video. An advice video on what to do to market your own books is a whole other kettle of fish. I've made them in the past, but at this point, they're old enough. I should probably just make a new one. I mean, let me know down below in the comments what you think. Do you have questions? Um, Bueller? Uh, give this video a thumbs up if you like really depressing real talk about publishing. I'm so sorry. <sighs> and if you're not already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and do that. I post new videos two to three times a week. Uh, call me dream crush or done. I feel like that's my thing now. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, as always, guys, thank you so much for watching. And I mean, genuinely, happy writing. Happy writing. Yeah. Happy writing. I mean, the writing is happy. Everything else is, it's harder. It'll be okay though. I actually enjoy marketing. So yeah, happy writing.